I patrolled the vast expanse of Yellowstone National Park, a place of breathtaking beauty and tranquility. But lately, an eerie sense of foreboding had settled over the park, leaving everyone on edge. Reports of strange sightings and unsettling events flooded in, spreading like wildfire. Whispers of the Mothman had taken hold, fueled by stories shared on Reddit. As a park ranger named Ray, I prided myself on my rationality and level-headedness. I didn't easily succumb to stories of cryptids and supernatural beings. However, as the days went by and more sightings piled up, even my skepticism began to waver. The Mothman, according to the Reddit threads, was a winged creature associated with impending disasters. Its ominous presence often served as a harbinger of tragic events. I tried to dismiss it as nothing more than folklore, but the growing tension among the park staff hinted at a collective fear. One night, under the watchful gaze of a full moon, I embarked on my usual patrol. The air crackled with an electric energy, and a thick fog enveloped the trees, lending an eerie atmosphere to the park. I glanced around, my senses on high alert. And then I saw it. A silhouette emerged from the darkness, the unmistakable shape of a winged creature. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity. The Mothman. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I fumbled for my camera, desperate to capture evidence of this elusive creature. Before I could steady my trembling hands, the Mothman lunged at me. Its wings flapped with a thunderous roar, and I staggered backward, my heart pounding in my chest. It tackled me to the ground, but before I could react, it swiftly disentangled itself and took flight. Disappointment washed over me as I scrambled to my feet, my camera now a useless weight in my hands. I watched as the Mothman disappeared into the night, leaving me with a mixture of awe and frustration. The encounter had been brief, yet it confirmed the existence of this enigmatic cryptid. As the days turned into weeks, the park staff continued to report unusual occurrences. Mysterious accidents, unexplained phenomena, and an overwhelming sense of unease weighed heavily on our minds. The Mothman sightings had become more frequent, intensifying the sense of impending doom. I realized then that my skepticism had been shattered. The Mothman was no mere folklore. It was a part of Yellowstone's dark tapestry. I delved deeper into the Reddit threads, searching for answers, desperate to understand the cryptid's purpose and the impending disaster it seemed to foretell. In the end, despite my efforts, the catastrophic event that had been lurking on the horizon arrived. A violent earthquake shook the park, unleashing chaos and destruction. Buildings crumbled, trees splintered, and panic gripped both visitors and staff. As I surveyed the aftermath, I couldn't help but wonder if the Mothman had come to warn us, or if its presence had somehow triggered the calamity. The answers remained elusive, lost in the chaos that had engulfed Yellowstone. It was dead in the middle of winter, and he was working on a camp on a remotish island in the Boundary Waters far north of Minnesota. On this island is a bunch of different cabins, some for sleeping, some for storing things, and one which housed the dining area for the camp. On the one phone on the whole island, my dad received a call from the sheriff from the nearest town. Granted, this town is miles away and across a frozen lake and through miles of forest. The sheriff told him that there was a call for 911 coming from the phone that my dad was talking to him on. He talked to the two other people that were also working up there at the time, both of which were on the opposite side of the island. After checking around to see if there was anyone else there, he went to loon through the other cabins and found nobody. He always tells me that was the only night he slept with a loaded shotgun next to him. I hunt, but I have two stories from the same spot, and I wasn't hunting during either of them. My family was camping in a canyon in southeast Idaho. This location is accessed from northeast Utah. I was about seven at this time, so that would have been around 1981-ish. We were on a family camping trip, and it was about nine at night, and we are all hanging out around the fire. I remember this part because it was so weird. All of a sudden, my dad looks at my mom and in a hushed voice says, Get the kids in the car now. My mom was caught off guard and said, What do you mean? And he said back, 
Get the kids in the car now as fast as you can. Well, my mom was mad but started telling us to all get in the car, so we all did. After we were all in the car, my dad hoped in the driver's seat, and we backed out of the campground and drove one hour and ten minutes home. Leaving everything we brought at the campsite, including the fire burning, I know this is bad, but this was the ADS and I'm sure none of us had our seat belts on either. The next morning my dad and uncle went back up and loaded all of our stuff up and brought it home. Okay so no flash forward to about 2003 and I'm talking to my older brother about this camping trip. And I asked him why did we leave that night. Well come to find out we were being watched by. Well something. So as my dad was sitting there and he was looking at a line of bushes about 20 yards away, he watched a head walking back and forth behind these bushes. Here is the kicker. The bushes were about six to seven feet tall. I guess my dad watched the thing for about 30 to 60 seconds before it turned its head and looked at us, and he could see the two eyes reflecting back at him because of the firelight. It scared him so bad he made us all go home that second. My brother said he never did say what he thought it was, he just knew it was large and tall. Two. Same spot as camping trip from one. It's about 1995 and me, my friend and younger brother are camping in this same spot because we were going to go fishing the next day. Remember I did not know about why we left this spot until years after this. It was about 2 a.m. and we were all sleeping when down from the canyon to the east of us came the low scream. It wasn't like a woman's scream, it was low like a man yelling, but that's not even a good description. And the reason I know it came from the east was we woke up to it, and as I was saying what was that, it screamed again. We did not sleep much that night and we all put our handguns in our sleeping bags with us. Edit. Also that gut feeling people described above is something I have had many times there. I don't think I have been back there since I found out why my dad left. Not from being scared but more of I don't live by there anymore. Something pretty crazy happened to my best friend and I about six years ago. It was the summer after we graduated high school, so we were in that transition phase between high school and college. No responsibilities. No worries. We played a shit ton of video games during the day, took spur-of-the-moment road trips to a bunch of places, and often stayed up all hours of the night. Late one particular night, we were driving around in my friend's dad's old Volvo, and we stumbled upon the entrance to a nearby canyon we had never heard of or been to. By this time, it was about three in the morning, but we were curious, so we start heading up the road. We were in high spirits, music loud, cracking jokes and weird accents, the usual. But down the road, we see this sign. It was one of those cement road barriers. There was a number of them parallel to the road, but this one was placed perpendicular, and it said, no camping in X Canyon in red spray paint. My friend and I looked at each other. We thought that was a little weird. With most of the nearby canyons, whichever government entity that maintains them has official metal or wood signs erected. But it wasn't anything too out of the ordinary, so we shrugged it off and kept going. At the base of the canyon, it was mostly meadows with low bushes, but further in, it became much more wooded. The scrub oak had grown tall over the road, creating a sort of tunnel. It was beginning to feel a little eerie and claustrophobic, but we weren't the skittish type. We both acknowledged the creep factor of the canyon and kept driving. Then another sign. This time it's plywood nailed to a tree, said the same thing. No camping. Red spray paint. Again we're thinking, what the hell is with this place? So now we're both fairly sketched out but we didn't really know why. Yes, the makeshift signs were odd, but maybe whoever maintained the canyon just hadn't gotten the official signs put up yet. Yes, the forest had a spooky vibe, but don't all forests feel like that at night? So again, we kept going. But the further in we went, the less we talked, until we both didn't really say anything. Then it happened. Up ahead, through the scraggly tree branches, we see this light. A campfire. We slow down. My friend asks me what time it is, so I check my watch. 3.45 am. You know that, oh shit. Feeling of deep, intense dread? Instantaneously, we both have it. 
I say we need to turn around, but the canyon road is too narrow, so my friend just starts saying shit over and over as he drives forward. Looking back, I'm not sure why we didn't just floor it driving past the fire, but I think despite the fear, we both had to know what was going on. So we drive up pretty slow, going maybe 10-15 miles per hour. The first thing that came into view was a bunch of cars parked in this clearing, just at the edge of the firelight. Then in the middle of the clearing we see the campfire, and a group of 7-8 figures standing around it in a loose circle. They weren't wearing anything strange. They didn't seem to have any weapons. There didn't seem to be anything other than wood burning in the fire. But there were no tents, no camping chairs, and every single one of them were frozen in place, staring at us as we passed. The second we get beyond view, my friend and I lost our marbles. I screamed at him to floor it, so he hit the gas until we came to a turnout just a little down the road where my buddy made a miraculous U-turn. However, I do vaguely remember almost careening off a cliff. At any rate, we came flying back down the road, and again we see the fire coming up quick. Keep in mind, it's only been a minute, maybe a minute and a half, since we first drove past. The clearing came into view, and I shit you not, everyone is gone. The cars are still there. The fire is still there. But every single one of the figures is just straight up gone. We didn't call the police or even really talk about it much after that until, several weeks later, we decided to go back in the daytime just to see what was there. But when we got to the bottom of the canyon, those same cement barriers were now placed across the road, blocking the entrance. The one with red spray paint was conspicuously missing. Posted on one of the barriers was a metal sign that read, X Canyon closed due to ongoing police investigation. It was a crisp morning in June 1980 when my friend and I decided to embark on an adventure to visit our friend's newly constructed lean-to on Snow King Mountain near Jackson, Wyoming. Little did we know that this journey would take an unexpected turn, forever etching an encounter with the unknown in our memories. As we made our way up the mountain, excitement filled the air. We relished the opportunity to explore the wilderness and soak in the beauty of nature. However, our enthusiasm quickly turned to trepidation as we stumbled upon something that defied all logic and reason. There, amidst the towering trees and rugged terrain, we came face to face with a sight that would forever haunt us. A hairy, man-like creature stood before us, its massive frame reaching a staggering twelve feet in height. Long, dark hair cascaded down its hunchbacked form, with arms extending almost to the ground. Fear gripped us as we stared into the creature's simian-like face, which seemed as large as a stop sign. Its heavy breaths filled the air, accompanied by a haunting moaning growl that sent shivers down our spines. We knew we had encountered something truly extraordinary, something that defied our understanding of the natural world. Instinctively, we turned and ran, desperate to escape the presence of this mysterious creature. To our dismay, it pursued us relentlessly, never relenting in its pursuit. We could hear the creature's eerie sounds reverberating through the trees as we sprinted, hearts pounding in our chests. The chase seemed never-ending, our adrenaline-fueled sprint blurring the boundaries between reality and the surreal. It was as if we had stumbled into a realm of myth and legend, where the lines between human and beast were blurred. Finally, as our strength waned, we reached a streetlight near the Ramada Snow King Inn in Jackson. Gasping for breath, we dared to glance back, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature that had pursued us so relentlessly. And there it stood, under the flickering light, a specter in the night, before it vanished into the depths of the surrounding darkness. We staggered back, our minds reeling with disbelief at the surreal encounter we had just experienced. Rushing to the local police, we shared our tale knowing deep down that few would believe the magnitude of our encounter. The memory of that day still lingers, etched into the fabric of our beings. We were forever changed, forever aware that there are realms beyond our comprehension, where creatures lurk in the shadows, challenging our notions of what is possible. Though the world may scoff at our story, dismissing it as mere imagination or trickery, we know the truth. 
We crossed paths with the unknown with a creature that defied explanation, leaving us with a profound sense of awe and an everlasting curiosity about the mysteries that lie hidden in the depths of our world. I was driving from Las Vegas to Lake Havasu City in my truck, and it was around 1 a.m. The roads were mostly empty and the dark night stretched out ahead of me. After passing through searchlight, I found myself on a stretch of two-lane road, with bushes lining each side, seemingly reaching out towards the asphalt. As I cruised along, the monotony of the road started to take its toll on my senses. The rhythmic hum of the engine provided a comforting backdrop to the quiet desert night. But then, out of nowhere, a peculiar sight caught my attention. There, just before I passed, a large bush bent towards the road at an angle of about 60 degrees. It appeared as if something had forcefully knocked it over, causing it to lean precariously. Confusion and curiosity mingled in my mind. None of the other bushes seemed to be affected by the wind or any other external factors. It was an isolated incident, standing out like a mysterious anomaly in the stillness of the night. I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that something out of the ordinary had just occurred. Uncertainty filled the air as I continued my journey, my foot pressing the accelerator, propelling me forward at a speed of 90 to 100 miles per hour. The road stretched out before me, seemingly endless, and I couldn't help but steal glances in the rearview mirror, half expecting the bush to have righted itself or to witness some other strange occurrence. Eventually, the two-lane road led me to the freeway, where the atmosphere shifted. The sense of isolation gave way to the presence of other vehicles, their headlights piercing through the darkness. I merged onto the freeway, leaving the enigmatic encounter behind me. As I continued my drive, my mind raced with possibilities, trying to make sense of what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, an odd gust of wind, or something entirely inexplicable? The image of that bent bush lingered in my thoughts like a puzzle piece that refused to fit. My cousin recently moved here from Secunderabad, India. On a recent road trip exploring America, we were shooting shit, exchanging ghost stories and laughing at sea and differences between American and Indian ghost stories when I asked her if she's ever experienced anything supernatural. Her eyes widened as she averted her eyes to the window. When the silence was about to be too much for me, she softly responded, Yes, a few. One is troubling. In my second year in college, I stayed in an all-girl hostel dorm. I made many friends. We were all delighted to be away from our conservative parents in school. The hostel was so much fun, but it was an ancient building. Electricity was only put in the rooms. Sometimes candles were placed along the windows if a watchman was present, but generally you were faced with complete darkness once you left the chambers. It's common to wake someone if you need to walk down to the restroom at the end of the hall. We all had a childish fear of being alone in the dark. One night I had to use the restroom. It was about 4 a.m. I went to my friend's bed and tapped her on the arm. She immediately opened her eyes as soon as I touched her. I apologized for bothering her and told her I needed to pee. She smiled at me and hopped out of bed. Down the hallway, she laughed and danced. I could not see her, but her bangles clanked together loudly, and the bells on her anklets jingled softly. It was very calming. I laughed and sashayed my hips down the hallway with her, too tired to match elaborate arm movements. She said nothing to me, though occasionally I heard her hum one of our favorite Bollywood songs. The same thing happened on our return. Fell back asleep quickly. One awoke pretty late the following day to the sound of men in our room. They surrounded her bed. I bolted from my bed, prepared to protect my friend, when I realized they were college administrators. I peered over closer. My friend's lifeless eyes were fixated on my bed, the same smile on her fac. Her time of death was 11.30 p.m., almost five hours before I woke her. It was late night in late October, early November of 1975, I was a 10-year-old child. 
At that time I was going through a late bed wedding phase and remember I was determined to end that embarrassment. I awoke for the second or third night in time to relieve myself and remember being happy and proud that I caught it in time again. As my eyes creaked open slightly I saw movement in the room and at least what I thought were African American kids in my room moving around. I remember thinking that the only thing they could steal of any value was my prized small black and white TV that was on my dresser next to my bed. As you can imagine at this time my heart was pounding through my chest and just wanted them to take the TV and leave. I creaked my eyes open ever so slightly as not to be noticed and was shocked to realize that they weren't afros which were common at that time but were whole heads. I can't really express my thoughts of that instant realization when I saw who was really in the room at that time other than how in a nanosecond I went from there's no such things as aliens to oh my god they're real to what do they want. At that time there was no such things as greys or anything similar to what has been so defined into pop culture today. Being late October early November there was a harvest moon and I had a fairly large picture window in my room which lead to some fair amount of ambient room lighting which I shared with my five-year-old brother who slept in an adjacent bed next to mine. During this event I was creaking my eyes open enough as not to be noticed, laying on my back when I woke up and my bed covers were at my waist. All I wanted was to get my bed cover up to my head, so I was ever so slowly and methodically creeping them up during this entire event, as not to be noticed. There was a larger one that stood against the wall directly across from the foot of my bed that just stared at me. There was another knelt down on the opposite side of my brother's bed and what I thought at the time was that he was doing something to his arm. I my head at the time my mind was reeling, my parents room was directly behind me and if I screamed my father would come running in. I remember thinking that the one next to my brother I was taller than and equated him to being in my grade remember I was 10. So if he came over to me my big plan was to jump up and dive on him and scream for my dad. The one against the wall just standing there I remember as being a grade or two older than me and he would probably do something before my dad to get in. I remember thinking I could end the whole debate that are we alone in the universe and the weight of that thought being succumbed to he's killing my brother and not being able to muster the internal strength to do something. My next thought was that if he comes over to me he can't put a needle in me so I started to tear up and that diffused my sight to what was happening in the room. Then the one that was knelt next to my brother got up and came at me, pure horror as my eyes were teared and he rounded my brother's bed and in one motion knelt down on his right knee and in one motion opened his toolkit and kind of flipped and twisted his left wrist and reached in. At that very moment I couldn't hold it anymore and thought needle and I made an audible pre-cry wail. The face that the creature made still haunts me today. Honesty. It's the same face people make when they make a surprise mistake a eek I did something embarrassing facial expression. His mouth was just a slit so when he made that expression his face rippled and wrinkled like an old man. Immediately whatever he was taking out of his box which was a really weird shape then but not now, it was hexagonal with a diagonal opening and handle put it back and got up and they marched out. Again another part of this is memory that has crept me out is how they moved like the military and moved or better said marched out of my room. I was shocked and with unreal timing as I looked down the hallway when they passed my parents room two more came out and filed in line with such precision and marched down the hall and all turned down the stairs out of my sight. Again I must stress the timing was if they were one. Needless to say I didn't sleep the rest of the night. My younger brother was fine in the morning and no one in my family knew anything of the night's event. I lived near a large metropolitan area at the time and our house was the only house surrounded by 260 acres of woods. I only told a handful of people since then and find it very difficult and seriously doubt many of these accounts I read of abductions myself. Ironic isn't it? They were very, very real and I wish I dreamed it, but I didn't. My impression then and my life of the events of that night is that these beings are cold and indifferent to us. Basically, they are not our enemies, but most certainly aren't our friends. There might be a very good reason our government has kept this secret for so long. Being that I live on the coast of them's hate all you want, 
but just know that south of I-10 is nothing like the typical stereotype, which that in itself is far off as well. I have been on and around the water my entire life. I have many stories of crazy things and experiences happening while being on the water such as dealing with bad weather, lightning storms, water spouts, high seas, etc. Which can be awesomely frightening, but the craziest things I have seen have happened while running working on fishing charter boats. The one that always sticks with me and I would also say the most eye-opening occurred back in 2010 when the Deepwater Horizon oil rig blew and began spewing oil into the Gulf of Mexico. BP, after realizing to a certain extent how vast the spill was, began a program that allowed owners of boats to register and participate in the cleanup of the coastline. Side note. Those that were lucky enough to be accepted into the program sometimes took advantage of an awesome opportunity to do something good for the environment and made some serious money from it, while at the same time preventing others from getting into the program who would have actually helped that somewhat mentioned later, but overall is a story for another discussion. So being that the water that I had basically grown up on was being destroyed, I couldn't just sit back and not do anything. I went and got hazmat certified for this particular instance among other certifications and through certain contacts I first started working on a 127 feet charter boat. This boat normally will go out to the Chandelier Islands located off the coast of Louisiana for several days nights and drop skiffs in the water where clients were guided around the islands to fish also I would suggest if anyone has the opportunity to go out to these islands do it. It's incredible there and the fishing is always on point back to story. I was working on this boat for about two weeks and then was transferred to an offshore division that consisted of about 10-15 boats. These boats by the way were strictly personal fishing and commercial charter boats with the largest being 57 feet and an average price of around $100,000 and a couple worth well over a 1 million conservatively. Our job was to leave at 6 a.m. and go out and look for oil or any marine life etc. that may have been impacted by the spill. If we found oil crude, oil slicks, or anything else out of place or not normal, we'd log it, take pictures, and report it. For about a month, we were only finding slicks. One day we went out about 120 miles, and I'll never forget the sights or smells that day. The crude, we called it mud because that is exactly what it looked like, was everywhere and ridiculously thick on average 6 in, and in some places up to 1 ft. It was like a super thick putty and to be honest is actually really hard to describe. To put this into perspective though, if you have ever been mud riding or seen a truck get stuck in mud, that's exactly what it was like to these boats, but out on the water and a lot worse. This over time destroyed the boat's hulls among other things causing significant damage. We were the first group to find the crude and report it coming in that close to shore. Also during this time we found a life jacket belonging to one of the guys who actually worked on the oil rig. Words honestly cannot describe what that was like. It was a very surreal moment to say the least. So we eventually get back to shore and that's when things start to change. The operation had now shifted to how the hell are we going to clean this up? And what the hell are we going to do with it? It wasn't until this point when we all realized how serious this was, not only for the coastline but for the environment as a whole. The next morning at the dock we noticed that pallets of skimmers and absorbent boom had been dropped off. We were to use the skimmers to round up as much crude as we could, tie off the skimmers into a circle, and place the boom together with the crude inside. That would then be brought to decon stations by another division who was assigned that job these were the shrimp boats. Reminder, our job originally was to just spot, find, take pictures, and report. Not necessarily handle the oil if all possible. To sum up how that operation went, it was complete shit and that's being nice. It got to the point where instead of myself being the only one who could technically handle the crude on my boat, everyone else working the boats eventually ended up in tight suits handling this foreign ass toxic substance in 100 plus degree temperatures for 12 plus hours a day side note each boat had to have at least one hazmat certified person on board at all times who was supposed to be the only person handling the crude also only four people were allowed to work on each boat in our division 
We also ended up getting stranded twice by the shrimpers who decided to call it day at lunchtime leaving us with no way to move the crude while also not allowing us to leave because we couldn't just leave the rounded up crude unattended. Yay. Absolutely miserable. Nobody could ever have imagined what we were getting into. And along with that, BP themselves had no idea what they were getting into and their claims of being prepared. And we're on top of this with all available resources. Blah blah blah. Was completely overshadowed by the fact that they truly did not know how to run and contain an operation of this size and magnitude. And that was seen day in and day out. This became a day-to-day -day challenge up until the point when my shady-ass boss got caught being greedy charging BP for every miscellaneous thing he bought which caused all his boats to be shut down. His first check was said to be upwards of $450,000 and that's rounding it off. During this time both the employers, the boat owners especially and employees were making some serious money. What ruined it were the greedy bastards who just couldn't get enough. This has turn caused less boats that were actually doing it for the right reasons from being able to make a change out on the water. In total we worked a little over three months. Going out every day and seeing schools of dead fish, dead sea turtles, and the water that you grew up on literally turned into a mud pit, as that's exactly what it was, was disheartening to say the least. Though all that happened and we dealt with so much, there was one time where we saw that what we were doing might have been helping just a little bit. On one of our last trips, we were about 20 or so miles out past the barrier islands when we could see from a distance what looked like the water boiling and had a red, orange, and yellow color to it. When we got close, we realized it was a school of thousands of redfish and jack creville that stretched as far as we could see and was about 100 or so yards wide. Being in the middle of that surrounded by these fish just cannot be described with words. It was incredible, and that was the one moment that gave us hope that what we were doing was not a waste, and that we were in fact doing something worthwhile. Still to this day, it is the most incredible thing I have seen on the water aside from the oil spill itself. Lastly, just to throw this out there, there is still tons of oil out in the Gulf regardless of what people say. It's just buried and on the sea floor due to the so-called dispersants that BP claimed would break the oil up. It still can be found on the islands, beaches, and marshes. The marine life is just now getting back to normal again in the past two years, and it's only going to get better as long as some shit like this don't happen again. There is so much more that I could talk about from this time. Ranging from the oil itself to the things BP supposedly did and did not do. That's all for another day though. Again, sorry for the long post, but this one experience is always the one I come back to when asked about things I have seen on the water, and with this thread I felt it should be mentioned. Hunter slash mountaineer here. It was a chilly December morning. I hiked in pre-dawn, taking about an hour and a half to go three miles off the beaten trails got to my nest about half an hour before sunrise and started to settle in. The wind kicked up and a fog rolled in that was thicker than milk. Within a few minutes my visibility was five. I'm sitting tight, huddled up against the freezing wind when I start to hear twigs snapping close to me. For no apparent reason, what is normally a rapturous sound indicative of an imminently successful hunt sent a frosty chill down my spine. I chambered around in my lever action 30-30 as quietly as I could and lay flat on my back tucked against a fallen tree. The rustling was moving closer through the fog, but I couldn't see anything. The sun was starting to peek over the mountains to my east and visibility was starting to increase. The rustling of twigs and leaves was sporadic, sometimes directly in front of me, sometimes behind or beside me. I remember laying there, rifle across my chest, thinking to myself how silly it was to react like such a coward. I rationed with myself that bears and mountain lions are a rarity where I was, and I had likely stumbled into a herd of white tail that had bedded down. I decided to sit up. The rustling stopped immediately. As it was fully dawn by now, I was looking through the fog for the outline of my prey, which I had assured myself was literally all around me. It wasn't. Seemingly, nothing was. By now the fog had faded away and it was apparent to me that I was alone in those woods. 
I hunted all that day without seeing so much as a squirrel. Around three in the afternoon, after fighting the wind and an abnormally cold day, and not wanting to hike out by flashlight, I decided it was time to start back to the truck. Walking out of those woods was the most uneasy I have ever felt. Lawfully, once you make it back to the trail, you're supposed to clear the chamber of your rifle. Not that day. What is normally a stroll through the woods, I undertook with the seriousness of an animal being stalked. I would walk, then stop and listen. I never heard or saw anything during my retreat, but I could feel eyes on me. I was about 100 feet away from my truck when I rounded the last corner and saw, hanging at eye level from a tree by a noose, a stuffed bear in a blaze orange jacket. I'm a giant, broad-shouldered outdoorsman, but that one shook me something fierce. Well, I'm a trucker and a lot of my routes take me through Indian reservations. I won't sleep on a reservation unless it's a truck stop anymore because of this. Short story, but I was about 30 miles east of Tuba City and was shut down for the night as some potunk gas station in the middle of nowhere. I had just started to get into my book when all of a sudden I hear what sounds like people hitting the outside of my truck with open hands everywhere. It's on my roof 13 foot 5 inches about my walls, the back of the sleeper, sides of my sleeper. I grabbed my Bowie knife and bolted out my door ready to scare some kids. There was nothing. The ground was dirt and a little wet, but when I looked at the ground there were no footprints. My truck was dusty, but there were no handprints. That was one of the scariest things that's happened to me on the road. So like I said, if I'm on a res, unless there's a truck stop, I will not shut down. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.